Mm, check out my lentils. Mm, nice. Welcome to another... You're going to have to go and look at the video if you listen to this in audio and see what I was pointing at. Um, welcome to another episode of Rahala Stapa. This week in Leicester once again with the wonderful Grace Petrie. Fascinating chat with her uh, and I think you're going to enjoy it. If you like these things, why not come and see one live, my friends? What the hell are you doing sitting at home, watching it and listening to it, you idiots? Come out to the theatre. Uh, we're not doing anything till March and April 2020 as it stands, but I will be in back at the Leicester Square Theatre. These make great Christmas gifts as well, tickets. Uh, we're also going to the Birmingham Podcast Festival on March the 28th and we're in Norwich doing two shows in April. Go to richhang.com slash gigs. Birmingham and Norwich are selling very, very fast. Um, so book ahead if you want to come and see those. Norwich is nearly sold out. Go to gofasterstrike.com and you can buy emergency questions, books. You can buy Rahela Stupa, Top Trumps. All the money from that will go to funding more podcasts. You can buy my DVDs and my downloads. You can buy stuff from other fantastic comedians as well. Go to richhane.com slash gigs or rahalastapa.co.uk. Why not become a member finally? Spend £3 a month and get all those fantastic extras, backstage videos, and just the peace of mind that you are helping us make more podcasts. That's what all your money's going on, just making more content for you. I think 2020 is going to be a big year, my friends. My fine friends. Anyway, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahala Stepper with Grace Petrie. It's behind the table. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Haymark Theatre. Unless we came back for a, a second uh, week. <laughs> we liked it so much. And look, if it isn't the second week, how come he's wearing different clothes? That, <laughs> there, wouldn't be possible. It's Richard Herring. It's twisted my leg. It's twisted my leg. So I'm going to carry on through the pain. I, uh, I did. I, I went to my personal trainer. I've got a personal trainer. Uh, I went. I did, I did a personal training session earlier today, and uh, yeah, that really fucking hurt. And luckily, I'm sitting down mainly. Uh, so welcome to Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre Goers podcast. Uh, we just got together the most square people in Leicester. And uh, they're coming to see the theatre, see what they see how they get on. It's another insult to you. Uh, I genuinely, um, someone uh, bought tickets to this show thinking it was at the Leicester Square Theatre. So someone, someone may have got those tickets. <laughs> I was hanging out at Richard III's tomb uh, today, earlier today, and the ghost of Richard III came out of the tomb. And after saying it was, it was disgusting that he was buried in the place he was murdered, and that's just insane. So what's that's so offensive to me. I'm from York. Why am I not in York? It's like, it's a punishment to me. People have less disgust me. Uh, he said he calls it Rehlestabe. He said, he said, can I have a sandwich? I said, you have to wait half an hour. He said, it's fine. I'm happy to, happy to wait. Uh, I didn't get too many Leicester fans. I used to, used to like to check the local papers uh, usually, but in Le- the Leicester Mercury is not amusing. I have to say, the news is... The news in Leicester is not an, uh, not an amusing topic. Let's leave that behind. Uh, I did find out some facts about Leicester. Uh, one fact. In 1841, Thomas Cook created the first package tour from Leicester, uh, which was a train from Leicester to Loughborough, which is... <laughs> well, I guess the thinking behind that was we'll send people to the only place in the world that is worse than Leicester <laughs> so they won't complain about living in Leicester anymore. That is the only thing I can think of. I say that on someone who grew up. 160 Leicester Road, Loughborough. I used to live at when I was 48, near the Ladybird factory. Who remembers the Ladybird Books factory in Loughborough? Yeah, not there anymore, is it? Well, it's there, but it's not a Ladybird Book fa- factory, is it? <laughs> trying to give you some <laughs> local material. So, um, <laughs> Loughborough, amazing. It was great in Loughborough. My, anyone know my best friend from Compton School in Loughborough, Satish Patel? Anyone know him? It's weird, it's really difficult to find him on uh, Google. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of potential people it could be. He's my best friend. 
If you're out there, Satish, I'd love to see you again. We had great friends. He was a lovely guy. But he's like 52 now. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's a little boy. He was a little boy. <laughs> I really can't get my head around time. So, um, anyway... <laughs> My guest this week is probably best known for her appearance on The Chase. <laughs> which is all I'm going to talk to her about. <laughs> Will you please welcome Grace Petrie, ladies and gentlemen. She's from Leicester. She's one of yours. She's from Leicester. Come in. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Very well, thank Good. you, yes. This is you your went with The Chase. Yeah, The Chase. Yeah, you could have gone for The Weakest Link as well. You've been on The Weakest Link as well? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've got so much to all, talk mate. about. We've got so much yes, to talk I've about. I've lost a variety of quiz checks. <laughs> you were on The Chase as a civilian, though, not as a celebrity <laughs> chase. <laughs> Uh, you're a yes. civilian chase. I'm not, yeah, I don't think I... <laughs> you're a celebrity. Celebrity chase is no, not available to me, I don't yeah, think. I think it is. I've okay, seen, well, you right. seen some of the celebrities they have on that thing? <laughs> I'm quite offended. I've not been asked and I've been on Tipping Point now. Have you? Did you, not, did you, did you win? Did you find your to, Tipping Point? Not allowed. I was up against a woman from Love Island, I think. Oh, OK. And uh, a guy who was in the Crow Road, he's, he's been in something more famous than that. He, he, he won uh, Strictly Come Dancing or whatever it's called. Okay. Do you know who I'm talking about? Anyone managed to work that out from those two clues? Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do very well on the chase, would you? <laughs> you might do all right on tipping point. They do multiple choices, it's easy. So, uh, well, how did you get on the chase? Uh, who, who was the chaser? Uh, the governess, okay, Anne Hegarty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, got a signed photo of her. <laughs> you good. Uh, did you was get... given, didn't ask for. <laughs> <laughs> no offence to her. <laughs> Found it when I was moving out. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> What to do with that? Um, yeah, up against the governess and Hegarty, made it to the final oh, chase, okay. but I did not win any money. But oh. um, I, the, I think the best thing I got out of the chase yeah. was um, when I was uh, obsessively searching Twitter <laughs> for people talking about the chase on the day that I was on the chase. There was a question about Orange is the New Black. Right. And I got it. <laughs> In the final chase, and my teammate, who'd been doing much better than me, didn't know what it was, and I, and I knew what it was. And somebody just tweeted, uh, LOL, the gay on the chase <laughs> knew the answer to that Orange is the New Black question so fucking quick. And I thought, yeah, I'll take that. The gay on the chase. Uh, and so which is did the name me, of my say. memoir, actually. Yeah. <laughs> the gay on the chase. Aren't they all? So, um, <laughs> <aren't> they? <laughs> what about the weakest link? When, when, when the weakest link um, has been on for ages. When I you know. Like... I was nineteen. Wow. I was foolish. How, did, thought... how far did you get in the weakest link? Second round. Well, it's not yeah. very good, is it? But it was a three-way. To... No, it's, it's not, not very really good. good. <laughs> it could arguably <laughs> scarcely be worse. Uh, only by one round. Um, it was a three-way tie. Right. And um, uh, uh, I wasn't the weakest link. But the guy who'd, who had initially voted... For, you could probably can't even fucking remember how it works, can you? It was ages ago. But uh, the, the guy who was the strongest link has to decide yeah. who gets voted off, and he had initially voted for me. So. Them's the breaks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you get a signed photo of uh, Anne Robinson? No. Ah. No, but I tell you, Bradley Walsh is much nicer than Anne Robinson. Is he? Yeah. yeah. She, doesn't, she didn't talk at all, apart from when the cameras were on. Yeah, she's she's, she wasn't very really good, I didn't think, at that job. No. It was all fed to her. It was clearly fed to her. And if anyone... When you comedians on, they would talk back at her and she had nothing. Mm. Okay. Although she did say of one of the women who voted me off, um, which uh, th these days I'm much more of a feminist and have more complicated feelings about this, but she said, um, Why, Grace? And this woman went to answer and she went, is it because she's younger than you and prettier than you? And I was like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Anne. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> I think we all know it was. <laughs> the other the thing I nearly went for was you were the bartender at Sheffield University. <laughs> I was. That was, the, that was, the, that was my, my sins. <laughs> yeah. How long did you work at the bar at Sheffield University? I lived in Sheffield for three years wow. and I was probably there, it was at least a year, yeah. yeah. Bartender is like overstating what okay. I did. Um, there was a job called, I worked in the club nights, which yeah. was between 10pm and uh, like 4am. And there was a job you could do um, called collect, which was 
um, I would go onto the dance floor, the sticky dance floor of the Sheffield Students' Union bar, and I would pick up the discarded plastic glasses wow. that students had had their one pound vodka and coke in. Wow. And um, I volunteered for that job a lot because a lot of those students would just, uh, they'd drop a lot of money on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so the least I ever made in a night was 80 quid. Wow. And the most I ever made was 130 quid. I'm talking about like paper money. I'm yeah. not talking about like, you know, coppers. Wow. You know. Shefford if University. I ever saw anyone dropping it, I'd be like, you dropped your money. But, yeah. if, but most of the time you just see it on the ground. More fucking money than cents. That is amazing. <laughs> And all the student loans and stuff. I suppose, yeah, I you, well, we got, we're so in debt, we might as well just throw this money away. It's basically, it's basically yeah. worth it. You know. Let's, yeah. let's give it a... And also, you could probably drink any free drinks that were left over just in the... <laughs> you could just drink the dregs That's of the... It. And yeah. lick, lick the booze off the floor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Probably some peanuts on the floor you absolutely. could eat. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> money and E. coli, that's what I got out of that. Yeah. <laughs> So you've got, I mean, it's an interesting career. You've got an interesting job you've got. That's and it three does, things. That is does, an interesting career. It is, but it's, how do you, how did it begin? How did the, I mean, I, it's not, I mean, I'm not that into music, right? And I say, you know, why do you do music? We've got words now. <laughs> so just, just do the, just, if you want to say something, just tell people what it is. Yeah. Don't have to sing it. Yeah. I'm not in here singing what I want to say, am I? I'm just, I just say with the words yeah, what sure. I want to say. Yeah. So that's my first question. A lot of people would argue I barely sing as well, <laughs> to be honest. There's very so, little music involved why in don't, what I do. Yeah, you do, but I, I like your stuff because there's lots of words in it. Thank you. And they're clever words. Thank you. And they're funny words. And you're, it's, you're funny as well as being quite serious about a lot of things as well. What I'd also say, I'm not, I'll let you talk in a second. <laughs> After I, people will come to me for my musical opinion. Uh, there's a lot of songs that are very sweet and uh, are love songs, not necessarily romantic love songs. There's a lovely one about your niece. It's a beautiful, very sweet song. Mm. Uh, the Black Tie one we were talking about backstage, which is a beautiful song. It's about sort of longing for the well, not longing for the past, but like defeating your enemies and, and <laughs> well, becoming a better person and being able to tell your teenage self about that. That's a very sweet and moving, beautiful song. Thank you. You do a lot of political stuff as well. Yeah. How'd you get? How'd you get into all of this? singing stuff well um, all this singing stuff um, I, um, I started playing the guitar when I was 13 mm. um, as a way to impress girls <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, it's, it's been 27 years and it's not worked yet, so uh, uh, it certainly didn't work at the time but uh, I was in a band with three uh, boys at school and we were united only by that being our shared goal, was right. to impress girls. It was a fucking dreadful band. Uh, and um, and what yeah. kind of music was that? Because it, well, oh, I mean, it's, it's hard to awful. describe. But what was the genre of music of that oh, band? It, it, we thought it was rock. Right. <laughs> um, but it was probably like, oh, I don't know, a poor man scouting for girls. <laughs> and that's um, a poor man. Isn't yeah, it? isn't um, that scouting for girls? That's a bloody poor man. Um, but I, and then I, um, I, yeah, I just I kind of always wrote songs, and then I started, I started, um, started writing about politics yeah. uh, in 2010, uh, around about May the 8th, 2010, <laughs> um, when uh, we got this fantastic Conservative government uh, came in. And um, so you're about 20 then, were you? Or was, um, 23, than... 23, 24, yeah. Um, so and then and it's funny because it wasn't a, a, yeah it didn't intend really to be a, be a, a political artist and certainly didn't intend to be a protest singer which is the thing that I get called the most um, but um, I think I just never like a lot of us had never <laughs> I've never had that much to complain about before, well, before that yeah. you know I'm white and I'm able bodied and I'm cisgendered and I came from a very very middle class background where my Family certainly were amazing about me being gay, and I never had any issue. I never had any kind of reason to suspect that would ever be an issue. And then in 2010, the the government uh, the Tories got in, and, and uh, Theresa May famously was um, made the Home Secretary, and she was made the Minister for um, Women and Equalities. Yeah. Um, despite not being fond of either, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, and. Um, uh, uh, and, and so I just, I, I just I wrote a song in response to that because it was the first time I'd ever really thought, and it's, it, 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 I actually find it a little bit sort of um, 
vulgar now that how, like how privileged uh, uh, and sheltered a life I've had that it took me until my early 20s before I was like oh you know I'm actually I'm actually a minority here and, and this you know this the rights that I have as a gay person and as a woman uh, I don't you know they weren't always there people yeah. people went before me and fought and, and died for them and there will always be people trying to take them away and Theresa May um, if you don't know has uh, voted against LGBT legislation or abstained on it uh, at every opportunity in her career and certainly had done at the point at which she became um, Minister for Women and Inequalities. And so I had a sort of quite visceral reaction to that. I was like, oh, you know, the person who's in charge of my liberties, actually, as a gay person, is someone who is has used her power to be homophobic. And that yeah. was the first time I thought, um, you know, that, that this, the, 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 you know, the politics of what's going on can actually affect my life, you know, as a gay person, politics in this country has changed in such a way that affects my actual rights, you mm -hmm. know, as a as a citizen. So I wrote a song, uh, kind of dashed off this song that was like a bit of a political rant um, called Farewell to Welfare. And I didn't um, think anything of it, really. And then the first time I played it at a gig, people started coming up to me and saying... Um, Oh, you're you're a protest singer, and you're like a female Billy Bragg, and uh, and then I started sort of getting more into politics, and yeah. No, I wish I never fucking had. <laughs> God, aren't you're things aren't things awful? <laughs> yeah, no, I well, I got into it thinking it's funny. I was I said I was like 22, 23, uh, and I was like, you know, ah. Oh, because it was around that time that we were like, you know, marching loads. The student marches were going on all the time and, and, and we were having um, occupations. You know, remember we occupied St. Paul's and I remember thinking like, wow, you know, this is it. My generation is, is going to save the world. And, uh, and we didn't. Uh, <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, I started writing songs thinking, oh, I'll, I'll be able to make my songs. We'll make Britain a better place. And, uh, and I think, if anything, I've made things worse. Yeah. <laughs> things are just going from bad well, to I, worse. I did hit the moustache about the same time, which is about trying to get people to vote and to stop right-wing politics, and yeah. that didn't work either. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's it, it, best it. just not to do anything. Keep our mouths shut. I reckon so, I think yeah. just saw the poster, thought, oh, they're like that. Look, that guy should come back. It was good. <laughs> so I missed, we missed him. <laughs> Basically, Nazism was dead till I brought it back. <laughs> I'm delighted about that. Um, but, you know, I think, there, I think there was quite an apathetic... I mean, maybe I'm an older man looking at... There was quite an apathetic generation of young people, and I think, like, it's interesting that now that the world... I think, the, I think things are definitely turning and changing, and that's part of that yeah. process of the whole, you know, the, the, the uh, evolution... Not the, evolu the rebellion, the Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Um, you know, that is, could be a massive movement. The problem is, you know, kids, young people, really feel strongly about stuff, and then... You know, people don't take them seriously necessarily. Mm. So we've seen with Greta, and and then they get older, and then they have to do, do, earn money and things. And it, and you know, so it's 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 a, it's a difficult thing to keep that process going. I think, but I, I think, think it is changing. So, but also, I don't know. Like, I, I'm sort of relentlessly optimistic about things. Um, you shouldn't be. It's really I, bad. It, I know. Yeah, I can't <laughs> stop. Um, but I, I mean, it does. It seems to be the case that. Um, Political engagement, it seems to be much more widespread among children than yeah. it was when I was... Yeah. I mean, I remember, like, I sort of m marched out of... What a fucking obnoxious little... I marched out of school against the Iraq war. And, uh, and, and the, you know, I was very much in the minority there. You know, I think there was, like, me and about sort of ten other kids from yeah. my school um, did that. Uh, but whereas, like, you know, now... They're all, they're all like walking, you know, it's like widespread walk at school walk. There's one tomorrow, isn't there? There is, there's one tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and it seems to be much more. But the stakes are higher, you yeah. know, because um, the world's ending. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if you were a kid now, you must be like, well, this isn't, f I want to live. Yeah, well, hopefully, <laughs> I, I mean, I life. hope that will come, you know, it may come too late it's sort of weird I think with all these things you get a, a pendulum swing mm. and as something's dying and I think that sort of old school world is dying but, it, yeah. but then the death throes of it can make it survive a little bit longer than it would have done and in yeah. this case it could you know that that uh, ignoring of all those issues and basically everything you're talking about um, 
is uh, is the problem. But I think it does then, the next generation does then react against that, so the pendulum swings the other way. So if there's time, I think yeah. it'll be okay. It's just a question of whether there's time to sort out these yeah, problems. Yeah, that's it. But, um, but I, th- I mean, I think, you know, the, we're see- the backlash that we're seeing now against, like, all manner of social issues that, uh, you know, this, uh, I think in the last kind of six to 12 months, the amount of, like, high-profile homophobic attacks and stuff that have been in the in the press and the things that people are sort of allowed not allowed to say but choosing to say about gay people and about trans people and and queer people in general you know really i feel like britain is is more homophobic and queerphobic in general than it was five years ago and that's a strange like feeling to have because it's 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 just uh you sort of see things slipping in the wrong direction yeah and I don't, yeah, don't really know what to do. Yeah, about. I mean, I think someone, I, I was thinking about this, and I think someone being homophobic, and it, you see this through lots of different areas, but basically all the people who are homophobic are all dicks. Uh, it's basically just the signal. It's just the, it's the one thing that's consistent between all of them. Yeah. Like extreme, you know, ISIS, <laughs> uh, the Conservative Party. If you took out... They want to basically get rid of all homosexual people, but if you got rid of all the homophobic people... We'd I mean, be having if, a lovely time, I mean, it, what we? a world it would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you got rid of all the heterosexual people as well, on top of that, it might even be better. I'm, I'm doing, but, doing my best. <laughs> but, but I think the gay that's, agenda! I think that's it, you know, I think that's... I mean, if you definitely had the choice, if the emergency question was, would you rather destroy... I know which way you're going on this question, but some of my guests... We'd rather have all homosexual people or, or homophobic people wiped out. I think I think homophobic would be best out of those two. That's just my ideal. <laughs> I'm just. It's pretty uh, edgy of you. <laughs> it's pretty edgy. But it, what a world edgy it would comic. Be. What a world. Or maybe just fifty-fifty. You know, just random. <laughs> then it would make each. just take yeah one of yeah. one one in two of each of them would go and then you say to others right just pack it in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the rest of you will die as well. Yeah. And then that'll really confuse everyone. Yeah. Because, I mean, the homophobic people would be quite glad that half the homosexual people were already dead. But yeah. then they go, oh, but I could go next. So, you know, I'm not a politician. <laughs> I maybe don't have all the answers. It has sort of got... It sort of got more confusing because, I mean, it's a very... I mean, the trans thing and the, and the uh, gender-neutral thing, I think it's a very hard thing to talk about, right? I tweeted of what I thought was a very blank tweet about it. I thought just this is this won't get me into trouble this is the least thing we can all agree and then I just got a day of shit from like you know the, from, I've had shit from both sides of ev- nearly every argument I have to say because <laughs> people will <laughs> read in what they want to do but do you think people are just, it, it becomes very difficult to discuss some of these issues because you're afraid of what the reaction will be from either side you know, you know what I mean so if you if you nail your colours to a mast or even a little bit then you can get, like, you know, I found it very upsetting, A, that people who are calling themselves feminists could be, like, basically Nazis, uh, and B, that, you know, you, you're just getting this relentless barrage of stuff. Yeah. Do you think that's, you know, we, we want to be able to talk about it, and we want to, aren't we, I think people are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yeah. And so sure. they don't say anything. Yeah, I think so. But, but also, when you, when you say, talk about it... Mm. Uh, invariably we don't mean talk about it we mean tweet about it yeah. and write about it in the newspapers do you sure. know what I mean and yeah. it's, oh, I'm not allowed to say anything in my nationally syndicated column <laughs> uh, in a national newspaper um, but I think like t- I mean Twitter is so bad yeah you know and I'm and I, I, I'm still on it every day <laughs> <laughs> but it's so bad it's so bad and I think it's really um Social media in general, I think it's just, it's just like, um, people talk about the f- effect of it being an echo chamber, but I think it's, it, the power it's, it has to distort is much bigger, I think, than the power it has to affirm. Because I think, you know, I've had conversations, I, I mean, like, I've, I've spoken a lot about trans rights and, and spoken out against transphobia a lot, and a lot of the reason that I have done that is because I felt like I was put in a position where I kind of had to, because um, as a lesbian, as a butch lesbian, and somebody talks a lot on stage about being uh, both of those things, um, a lot of the kind of transphobic uh, argument that was being put across 
was, in my view, fraudulently sort of claiming to speak for butch lesbians. It was like, oh, you know, trans people are the erasure of butch lesbians. You know, uh, it, it, there's, there's, there's people, there's, there's roaming groups of trans activists who are going out and they're m meeting young lesbians and they're telling them that they're actually trans men. And that is not happening at all. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, but it, it, because we still don't actually have very many kind of butch lesbians in uh, positions of sort of public life or whatever, um, I, I think it is sort of our responsibility. It's incumbent on us if we have a platform of any size, I think, to sort of use it to say, well, actually, these people don't speak for me, these people that are claiming that yeah. they do speak for me. So I sort of got involved in just uh, saying, I'm, by the way, I'm not transphobic and don't assume that I am. And it's quite a sad state of affairs, I think, that a lot of trans people were quite relieved. <laughs> a lot of trans people in my, among my audience were quite relieved because they were like, oh, you know, these days, a lot of butch lesbians seem to be really transphobic and I don't think that's actually true at all I think it's just that that effect of social media where the uh, loudest voices are saying the craziest things that's what it is yeah um, you know so that's the only reason I, I sort of got involved in in talking about it and um, I've just had so much shit on yeah. on the internet I bet um, from uh, transphobic "Quote unquote feminists um, <laughs> who are uh, are very upset with me for not wanting to um, oppress trans people, and it, and it, and it is it's just really I I do find it very disingenuous because when I have spoken to people in real life, I've had people come up to me at gigs and talk to me in real life and say, well I, I'm not sure about this trans thing and this this trans stuff, and actually I think have you thought about this and have you thought about that, and when you actually have a conversation with them." a real conversation where there's a real human being on the other side of the words yeah. and you can see their face reacting and you can think, oh, this is actually a person that I'm talking to. Um, surprisingly, <laughs> it, you get a lot further with actual dialogue and actual discussion. And, I, and I've sort of, I think I've managed to kind of change a few people's minds about it. And you just don't, in my experience, you just don't have that option on Twitter. You know, people are, no. I'm amazed, constantly amazed, actually, at how little empathy there is there anymore you know people straight away just going in for things that you and and i think we're we're quite quick to dismiss it as trolling you know it's like there's at the moment there's this campaign like oh don't feed the trolls don't engage with the trolls but trolling is quite a different thing i think i'm worried about real people who are not trolls who just actually when they're typing something out and pressing send they're saying things to you that they would never say to you in real life no you know what i mean I yeah, think there's a real like empathy deficit there. Yeah, but it also just you know, on a subject that you might be like somewhere in the middle, or you're not conf you're confused about. It. So if you get like a load of hassle about something really tiny, you think, well, I don't like any of those pricks. You know, I'm going to mm. now completely go the other way. It's a it's a very um, so you know, it's not a good way to argue. It's not a good way to make anyone come around to your point of view. To no. to just barrage them with mm. you know that's wrong because of this 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 and you know. Uh, it does. It, it sort of seems weird to me. I, I do really love this. Uh, the black tie. Vi the song's great. Mm. It's got this. Thank you. you you've got it, and it's, it's got, like mm, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> it's one of my songs. If you haven't seen it, it's all. It's you know just uh, it's on YouTube and have a look at it. The video's lovely as well. And I think and I was saying to backstage. I think it's although it's very much about your experiences. You know, talking to your year eleven self and mm. you know everything's going to be all right. I think most people at school felt they were some kind of a freak or, some, or were abnormal in some way or they mm. thought everyone else was having a great time and they're having a terrible time. It really, you know, I think it's just a very moving song about adolescence and the, and the way Thank we you. grow up and, and we accept it. It also does have a fantastic line. Uh, <laughs> a fantastic rhyme which I'm sure you get uh, said to you all the time uh, the images that fucked you were a patriarchal structure. That is yeah. a... That is a <laughs> That's a pretty good rhyming couple, yeah, I have you to say. Yeah, <laughs> but I, did, I did have a biscuit when I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, nice one, Petrie. But, you know, it's, uh, what you see in the video is you, you've, you've got, you do a, 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 a ball with... Uh, so, yeah, a, so it's, well, it's like a, it's a, it's a prom. Prom, that's the idea. Call, yeah. I mean, that's an American word, obviously, but, um, yeah, I was... I, like, well, I wore a dress to my yeah. actual prom. Yes, I wondered I was 16, about and it yeah. was, like, the worst night of my life. Um, and I just felt uh, all, it's like all of the normal layers of feeling 
horrible because you're 16 and that's a horrible thing to be sorry if there's any in but it's a horrible <laughs> thing to be isn't it 16 um horrible place to be and um then there was just this awful this layer of i just can't describe how uncomfortable i was it was just dreadful it was like yeah just the worst thing and um and it's funny because i i think it's i, I take it as a as a compliment that people kind of say that it's quite it's it, this song describes quite a universal experience because I hope I mean that's the hope with it yeah um, but also I mean as I was saying to you backstage like I was I saw Hannah Gadsby's show uh, Nanette uh, which if you haven't seen is absolutely incredible and it's a stand-up show uh, and she is also a butch lesbian and she talks a lot about being a butch lesbian and the experience of being a butch lesbian in a in a world that um, is not set up for um, my people <laughs> um and you know i that changed my life actually that show it changed my whole the whole way that i see myself on stage and in the world and it really sort of made me realize that i've been kind of apologizing for myself and apologizing for the way i look and and uh, and, and uh, you know at gigs i used to i used to start my gigs by saying um i had a joke at the top of my gigs that was like uh the, the, the Guardian have called me a powerful songwriting voice and the Telegraph have called me a, a whining folk singer and the EDL have called me a smelly leather uh, and, uh, and there's truth in all three. And, and, I, and for years that was my open, that's how I opened shows and then I realised, and Hannah Gasby's got this line in, in this show where she talks about how um, <coughs> being self-deprecating uh, when you're, it's something to do with self-humiliation on stage and how she was like, I'm not going to humiliate myself on stage because I realised I was humiliating anyone in the audience who identified with me. And that was an immensely powerful moment for me because I realised that I have, you know, all my life I've been doing this thing where I have this insecurity about the way that I look and the way that I dress and the, the presentation that I have. And, you know, I was like 30 when I saw that show. <laughs> so... You know, I think I, I think everyone probably does have this kind of adolescent experience, but I do think those of us who sort of don't look the way that society is set up to expect or want us to look, you know, it's, you just carry it around for much, much longer. Um, and, I, you know, I, that sh seeing that show was absolutely life-changing for me. And then also turning 30 was a bit of a... I don't know, there's just something quite liberating about being like, I've, I can't fucking worry about this anymore. Yeah. You know, I might not, I don't know how long I've got left. <laughs> um, so I wrote, so I wrote this song as like a, as a, like a letter to my teenage self. Yeah. And then when it was written, we were like, well, what if we took that idea of this horrible prom experience and actually do something to try and sort of reclaim that experience or like exercise that demon a little bit of that memory so we rented a hall and I put this call out to sort of like young, uh, young fans, young listeners. And uh, loads of like queer fans came and it was like loads of girls in tuxedos and like um, loads of, you know, well, everyone, every possible sort of gender expression you can imagine in every uh, possible kind of clothing. And it was really, it was really, really beautiful. It yeah. really it felt, it felt lovely. And then it sort of intercut with scenes of me in a dress. Yeah. Uh, you look adult. really good in that as well. So yeah, I mean, you should thanks. go back. You yeah. should go back to that look. Yeah. It's nice well, look. it's funny because my mum, uh, <laughs> my mum really agrees with you, Richard. <laughs> and upon viewing the video, indeed, texted me so. So really, uh, really getting but, that, really know, getting but, that point home. But it does, you know, because I think because it's it, it is that. I think any teenager has been through something, and I, I totally take on board what you're saying. Mm. But I think then to, to watch a video of uh, other people who don't have the same experience as you, and I think it does does absolutely bring home. You know, these are just vulnerable young people like you were, who ha yeah. you know want to be themselves, and then there's you being okay, turning that into a massive positive. It's a, it's it's a it's a really fantastic piece of work. Thank you. Um, and, it, and everyone must see it. And it's got that fantastic line in it as well, as many others as well, I have to say. I had, anyway. I just had to do that on Radio 2 last week. Oh, did you? Yeah, and it was like before the watershed. Right. And, um, and, this, and <laughs> I was just on Radio 2 last week. <laughs> no, it's like the only fucking time I've ever been on anything mainstream ever in my life. And, uh, and they, did, they requested that I sing Black Tie. Right. I was like, is, 
can say, got to be black tie, can I sing anything else? Because that line, the images that fucked you are a patriarchal structure, is in the chorus, it's really prominent. And it's funny because I found, I found a tweet that I wrote immediately after I wrote the song saying, um, oh, I've just, I've just written a chorus that contains the line, the images that fucked you were a patriarchal structure. So guess it's goodbye to the mainstream. <laughs> and then two years later, I've got to sing it on fucking radio too before nine o'clock. So I changed it to the images that struck you, which I think we can all agree <laughs> makes no sense. At all. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Right, let's ask you this. Is Leicester as shit as it seems? Fuck you. <laughs> um, to the casual observer just passing through and yeah. seeing it just being really shit. Is it really well, like that? Why don't you it... ask King Richard III, mate? Uh, <laughs> I did, and he didn't He'd like rather it. stay here than in fucking let me, York. Let me... <laughs> rather be here with his murderers. Um, <laughs> I love Leicester. Yeah, I, I tell me absolutely what's... unironically love Leicester. Tell me what's the good things yeah. about Leicester to make up for uh, my prejudice. Yeah, all right, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Your little hot rod. <laughs> Is that what I mean? Yeah, I don't think I don't so. Know. I liked it, whatever it's a car, it was. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> hot head, <laughs> pip squeak. I don't know what I'm going for. Go um, it's got the um, largest uh, covered outdoor market in Europe. Yeah. Thank you. It's got the largest, longest, uninterrupted uh, row of terrace houses. Tudor Road! <laughs> and then we all killed him. Um, uh, 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 it's got the largest comedy festival outside Edinburgh. That's true. Um, and, well... Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was doing all right, mate. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Gary Lineker, Walker's Crisps, Engelbert yeah. Humperdinck. Football, um, the one the football, football that time. Football, was that time we were good at football for a bit. I think, I think, Les fun. I think Leicester might have won the Premiership the year that York City got relegated out of the Football League. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that might be the case. Those bones are magic. Yes. Um, um, Attenborough Art Centre, absolutely, yeah. yes. Okay. Nice. Um, where tonight I'm promoting a gig that I decided not to go to because <laughs> you asked me to do this. So uh, um, that's true, actually. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's always the... just been a, it's been a, it's been a great, it's d done great things for me. This city, love it. Yeah. The largest freestanding bit of Roman building. Yeah. Jewelry wall. Yeah. <laughs> so the front row. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not a tour guide. You know, I was, you don't know all of this. Shit. I was reading about it in the car on the way up, and then I went, I drove past it, and I was really excited. <laughs> So Leicester has changed for me. It's got, the, it's got the oldest gay bar in Britain. Has it? Has indeed. Yeah, yeah the Dover Castle. Yeah. Um, saw someone get glass there the other night. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it at this point in time, but, uh, you know, win some, lose some. Okay, I'll ask you in a minute. I'm going to ask you a random emergency question. We did some okay. backstage. Quite scared oh, this is, of this. I, mean, I always, like for you, nearly everyone I do this to, I just get just disgusting, rude things come up when I do this. For you, everyone I've asked you so far has been quite philosophical. Oh. What is the most beautiful thing you've ever destroyed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Have you ever had a... Have you Several ever... relationships. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most beautiful thing that I've ever destroyed... Have you ever smashed a musical instrument in a fit of peak? I've not, you know. No? No, I'm not really rock and roll enough for that. Um, uh, I'm not sure what I've destroyed. On my um, when I was on <laughs> this is this doesn't qualify as beautiful at all. Okay. Um, but when I was on my um, I was out celebrating my A-level results night, and um, celebrating was not really necessary, but <laughs> overstating <laughs> it a bit to have a celebration on those results. But um, I was I got pissed. And I thought it would be uh, a really good idea to see if my Nokia 3310 would ring if I put it in a pint. Okay. And it did. <laughs> and then the next day, my phone was fucked. Oh. And that's why I didn't do too well in my A-levels, guys. <laughs> Not a very smart guy. It's a Nokia. Yeah, I don't think I've destroyed anything um, no. very, very beautiful. Well, Nokia's, you know, Nokia, Pretty, yeah, the Nokia scientists would be annoyed people. to hear that you... Yeah. Don't consider their phone a beautiful thing. You can play Snake they, on that. Are community. they still alive? I mean, do you still get Nokias? I think uh, Nokia... Is... Think maybe I, maybe I, may have, I felled them all with you that might... one act. So maybe it could destroy it something quite profound. 
And if you had to uh, have, if you could go to any art gallery museum in the world and take one item and own it, is there anything you I'm would take, like? Uh, this is the one I was really hoping you wouldn't ask me. Oh, really? I thought I got out of this because yeah, oh, I can't asked. say you've already That was last week, though, so you, you came, you came <laughs> When I was here last week watching you interview Jenny yeah. Eclair. It's wearing a different jumper, so, you know, explain that. Um, explain that. There's no explanation. Yeah. Um, the two questions you asked her last week yeah. were the ones I was hoping you wouldn't ask me. Okay, that's the other one. one. I've got the next question lined up. Um, um, I don't know fucking anything at all about art. It doesn't have to be art. It can be anything. It can be like something yeah. from the, you know, it can be just like something from a museum of anything, like a, an artifact. Museum I mean, I of would anything. Ta- I would take, I, would, I, I really like the Lewis chessmen, the chess pieces that were found on the Isle of Lewis. And they're in the Museum of Scotland, I think some of the British Museum. I've got like pretend ones. I mean, they're worth a bit, but they're not, like, the most valuable thing. But I just would like a real one. Fair play. Yeah, so there could be um, stuff like that. Yeah. Could be um, um, a... I'll go with your answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like something from the Petrie... This is a real thing. Yeah. The Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. Okay. Just because I'm uh, a collector. <laughs> okay. I want all the things with my name on. Okay. I'll take everything out of there. It's, if it's my museum. I opened it. Okay, that's I didn't know about yeah. the peach. But like it's anything not... from ancient Egypt would be fucking great. Like have a man yeah. having a mummy. To, uh, can I have two uh, Tutankhamun's mask? Yeah. I'll to, take that. To, you can have everything fucking in there. Thank God I did year five. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Got me out of that hole. <laughs> my daughter is four and she says she wants to be a rock star. All oh, right. And she said to, this morning, she said, are you allowed to do two jobs? And we said yes, and she said, I'd like to be a Sometimes rock star. Sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> yeah, if you're a, she said, I'd like, to be, <laughs> I'd like to be a rock star and a teacher, she said. So she's going to be a teaching rock star. What advice would you give to my four-year-old daughter who currently cannot play any musical instruments? Okay. Um, in becoming a rock star. Is it a good idea to become a rock star? Would you advise someone no. to go into that, um, that world? I, uh, it is what it is, do you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm very lucky that I get to do what I do. The advice that I would give to anyone embarking on this life um, is you owe it to yourself to stay in premier inns and not travel lodges. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, the, there is a world of difference. There is. The, differ- the difference in... Pr- you can back They're me absolutely up on it. Absolutely, 100% behind you. The, ba- the difference in price versus the difference in experience... I'm not like working for them, the for Premier Inn. <laughs> We're sitting in very but Premier Inn. I fucking would. If Premier Inn wanted to sponsor my, t- absolutely. Yeah. Like if Premier Inn wanted to sponsor me, yeah. I would, I would, I would renounce my politics in a heartbeat. Lenny Henry's um, got it. So, yeah. no, sewn um, up, Lenny Henry. Uh, that's what I'd say genuinely. Yeah, yeah. go for a Premier Inn over Travel Lodge. It's very time. good. Yeah. I mean, I've said this many times, but I stayed at Travel Lodge in Cambridge, and there was someone else's bogey on the shower curtain, yeah. and that was the moment. And I didn't. I, mean, I just pushed the shower curtain away and had a shower. Uh, I didn't I touch it. I but. was on tour with Robin Ince and yeah. Josie Long and we stayed in a, in a travel lodge. I can't remember where it was. I think it was in Hull. And, um, and that is bleak. <laughs> you don't know the half. <laughs> uh, and Robin went to his room, Josie went to her room. Their rooms were really near the reception. And mine was like down a corridor and then left and then down another corner, ages and ages and ages. I was in like the furthest room away. And the curtains were drawn when I got in, so it was after a gig. And um, I was just like getting, you know, getting ready for bed and stuff. And I just heard this um, platform four for the 11.34 to... And I opened the curtain, and it was, it was on the fucking platform. It was like a, it was in a train station. <laughs> and that was like the last train of the night. And if I hadn't heard that, I would have been woken up at like five in the morning when all the trains... So I went down to the reception and I said, um, have you got another room? And they were like, yeah, sure, is there a problem? I was like, yeah, it's in a fucking train station. And they were like, yeah. And they had another room. I was like, did you think I just wasn't going to know? So they, yeah. Premier Inns, guys. Some people like they... As Johnny Donahoe says, everything's Premier but the Inn. Yeah. <laughs> you could just climb out the window and get your train. Well, I was driving, mate. So, uh, you know... Well, let's, you do, let's talk about that because there's been a, cross, a big crossover with comedy in your... I mean, there, there's a lot of wit in your songs, but you've been touring with Josie and Robin and you've done a lot of work with the Guilty Feminist yes, podcast. Yes, yeah, yeah. So how, how, how did that come about that you started working I don't with know. This? Yeah, I don't know. Well, I was... Um, I've, so, I've sort of started to get somewhere in music, uh, finally, after a lot of... A long, long, 
long few years of trying and not really getting anywhere. And for a long time, I was like better known in comedy than I was in music. Um, but I'd have to preface every gig with, <laughs> did you know that I'm not a comedian? <laughs> um, which people always, it's a dreadful thing because you say that and people laugh. <laughs> and they think it's a bit. And then you have to be like, no, no, I'm not a comedian. Mm. And then they look a bit panicked. And um, that's <laughs> what happened when I was, Yeah, that's what happened when I was on tour with Josie. Um, but I think, so I met Josie at Glastonbury um, in 2010. And uh, like I said, the government had just changed and I'd just written this song about it and I was sort of doing political stuff. We, met, we were on, both on Billy Bragg's uh, left field stage. And we just got on and uh, she's, she's great, isn't she? And um, she brought me on tour with her. And I think Robin saw me at the same gig. So he brought, she brought me on tour sort of, I think, that, that year and he brought me on tour the next year. Um, and then I just kind of started... The, I, I, w I would never describe what I do as, as comedy at all. Um, but because I've, it's so different playing to stand-up audiences versus playing to, to music audiences, especially at that point in my career when I was really just doing like quite noisy pub shows where you're just used to people kind of talking over you and you really got sort of work to get everyone's attention. And then when I was touring Josie, you know, went out there, obviously it's like a theatre... It was just like this, went out and, the, and uh, she introduced me and I came on stage and everyone just sat there, um, you know, arms folded, just listening very politely. Um, and I wasn't used to it at all. And I just did my songs and uh, to use what I believe to be a, a comedy parlance, <laughs> um, I died on my arse. Uh, and they absolutely hated it. And I rem I'll never forget, there was a guy in the front row and uh, and he just... Like, the moment I came out with the guitar, I just folded his arms, looked really uncomfortable and never stopped looking uncomfortable for the whole thing. Um, so the next night, I just, uh, I just tried to sort of tell a joke before I did anything. Um, and there was, I could feel this real, like, audible sigh of relief from the audience because they were, I think, obviously, you know... I, I sort of come out, and I'm obviously like a lesbian with an acoustic guitar and Doc Martens, and, they, and you know, I think they thought I was going to fucking burn my bra on stage or something. <laughs> so, and I was going on and about social, fucking social justice, never stop banging on about social justice. So, and I think that, you know, like, there's a bit of a stereotype that that could be quite humorless and quite worthy. So, uh, I think stand-up audiences, you just, you get a lot more from them if you just can kind of go... Just make, put them at ease by saying, I'm not, I'm not taking myself too seriously. Like, I am going to talk about austerity and I'm going to talk about homophobia and I'm going to talk about all these really heavy topics. But, like, you know, the, the overall <laughs> aim is to entertain you, yeah. ultimately. Um, so I started doing that. And then by the, end of the, by the end of the tour, we were on tour together for three months. And by the end of the tour, I got quite comfortable kind of talking, talking to an audience um, and now I've just been very, very, very fortunate that I've kind of, I've got a little bit of a foot in both camps because yeah. I think for a lot of years, the sort of level that I was working at, I wouldn't have been able to make a living from either music gigs or comedy gigs, but I was, I was kind of doing enough of both to sort yeah. of keep me afloat. So yeah, I think it's, it, it's I'm like a, I'm, I'm, I'm like, sort of funny for a musician <laughs> and I'm sort of a good singer for a stand-up. Yeah. Well, a lot, of the, a lot of the 70s... The Lib Dems of entertainment, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> <laughs> what a thing I just called myself. <laughs> but that was in the 70s. That was, I mean, that's sort of where a lot of the... I mean, Billy Connolly and Mike Harding... Sure. I mean, the, 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 the stand-up bits got longer and the, the music got shorter. I don't think they're necessarily as good as musicians as you, but it was... It was I mean, they were still good, but um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting way to go. And do you feel? Because I, I get a sense that you feel you don't kind of fit into any kind of genre yeah. or, or anything you're doing with your music. Yeah. I remember I thought there was a lovely thing about saying that you know you're doing politics in folk music. It's fine if you're doing about the peasants' revolt, but they don't want to hear about politics Absolutely, now. Absolutely, yeah. Which you know, so presumably whoever did those folk songs about the peasants' revolt was hated at the time. <laughs> yeah. Shut about the peasants' revolt, mate. Yeah. Talk about 1066. Come yeah. on. They weren't nominated for any folk awards either. <laughs> I think. So yeah, it's, 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 but is that a good thing to not fit into like a, a to um, be a bit of a square peg? I suppose. I'm starting to feel like it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, 
I think that I'm, I, I think that I'm very, very lucky to have lived in the time that I live in because, um, you know, uh, talking about making your own work, you know, I think that because I've had, because I've, I've lived in an age with the internet, I can just publish my own work. I can make my own, I can record my own stuff and I can release it um, basically without the industry. I've never really had anything to do with the music industry and the music industry has never really had anything to do with me. <laughs> um, and, you know, somebody like me 20 years ago, I'm sure, wouldn't have had a career because, um, you know, in music, certainly, I think it, it, for such a long time, it was such a small group of people who were just tastemakers who just had all the power. Yeah. And just, just, you know, they used to be sort of such a... Compared with what we have now, I think there used to be so much of a reduced number of acts who were allowed to sort of be big and be successful. And, you know, they, it was such a small group of people that was choosing who that was going to be. And I have never needed anyone's permission to, to you know, and, and that's what I think is really beautiful about um, find, being able to find your own audience with, with the internet and having this incredible tool where we can just make our work and put it out there. And, you know, you, you'll find your tribe. You know, you'll find the yeah. people who like what you do and you know the world's a big fucking place you know and there's a, and the, most of it's on the internet and they'll find you know enough of them will find what you're doing to kind of keep you afloat um and now you know now I'm at this point I would definitely wouldn't have wouldn't have done it any other way you know when I was sort of in my early 20s I the thing that I was desperately you know aiming for and, and hoping for was to get a record deal I was desperate I wanted to get signed and get a record deal and I've never had any, I've never had a record deal, I've never had any, in, no one's even <laughs> threatened a record deal in my direction. <laughs> um, but now I'm really grateful for the way that it's gone because nobody has ever had any creative control over what I'm doing apart from me. I've never had anybody saying, you know, like, can you make it a bit less, you know, gay or a bit less, you know, whatever <laughs> it might be. You know? and, it, and it's funny because, you know, Black Tie, to me, I, it, it was such a, writing that song was such a sort of niche experience. I thought it was such a kind of um, specific story just about my life. And when I wrote it, I thought, you know, it meant a lot to me, but I thought, well, I can't imagine this is really going to do very well. And it's been like the most commercially successful thing that I've ever done, yeah. which is funny because I do think, you know, when I think about 20 years ago when it was just record execs with, with big cigars, you know, going, hey, kid, I'm going to make you a star. I think like... It's certainly, I'm, I am assuming, but I think if somebody like me had gone to those people and said, I've written a song about the experience of being a butch lesbian in a patriarchal society, I don't think they would have gone, it's a hit, we've got a hit on our hands. Um, but, you know, so I think it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to be able to sort of be whatever you want. And, and you know, increasingly, I think in the, in the like streaming world, you know, we're so obsessed with categorising things into genres and and I've had a kind of weird time. I mean, I sort of call myself a folk singer, but I absolutely appreciate that most of the folk world considers that to be <laughs> insulting to their work because uh, folk has got a lot of kind of traditional roots, which I'm not really a part of any of that. Everything I do is contemporary. Um, I've, it, you know, I've been sort of accused of being like a punk singer at points. I've been accused of being, you know, comedic... Um, whatever, and I think, like I said, it's just it's been nice to have a foot in a few different camps, like a spider, <laughs> um, and 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 be able to kind of pull enough people from all of those kind of weird and sure. wonderful worlds to be able to just have this. But it does mean that my my own audience, when I do my my headline shows, I always say that my my audience, because of that, because I've worked in so many different genres. Uh, my audience is a bit like that game you play where somebody draws a head and then you fold over the paper and pass it on to someone else and someone else draws a body and then you fold it over and someone else draws the legs. It's sort of no, there's no like, I have no <laughs> sort of ideal demographic. But I think yeah. that's amazing. I think that's well, lovely. Is. And it's the same thing, I think, about, you know, when it is a, a, someone making a decision saying, oh, will people want this? Will ever, you know, Actually, people want to hear about other people's experiences, and yeah. people, you know, and actually, that's interesting. If anything's bringing the world together when it's being torn apart, is actually if you get to view someone else's life and, like you say, see them as another person and mm. be able to listen to what they're saying, it's sort of interesting to know about 
someone else's culture or someone else's, you know, someone from another country yeah. or someone with a different way of looking at the world from you or a different, bit, you know, different internal mechanism to you. And so, you know, people are... I think it brings people together, you know. Definitely. And, fi and finding the, you know, like, when art is good, <laughs> when it's just universally good, yeah. you know... Uh, that it just transcends all of that, I think. And, you know, I, th I mean, I'm just going on about Hannah Gadsby like a fangirl. But, you know, that show has just gone incredible. It's taken over the world. Yeah. You know, she just won an Emmy for it last week. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I, I think that is interesting that, you know, something like that, a story like that told by somebody like her, which is just maybe not something that... Because for such a long time, I think, the, the only, most of the experience that we were seeing reflected anywhere in culture was kind of overwhelmingly straight and overwhelmingly white. I mean, it's, a lot of it is still overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly able-bodied and cisgender and all kinds of things. Um, but now, you know, seeing a story like hers and actually saying, well, look, look how well-received that's been. Look how, much, how successful that's been, how much it's taken over the world. And actually, maybe it's not such a fucking risk to put somebody on TV who doesn't look like everyone else has ever been on mm. TV. Because if it's good... It's, it's clearly not only butch lesbians that's seeing her show. You know, yeah. it's not... I don't think the Emmys are decided <laughs> by the confederation of butch lesbians. Do you know what I mean? I think other people must have clearly liked it and thought it was good for it sure. to do so well. Sure. Same well, you know, that's the... Hopefully, the, that's the good side of the internet, hopefully. Hopefully, it's... You know, you find your audience and then the audience can find you as well. And it's, mm. you know, it is, it is interesting. So you are on tour. You're coming to... I'll mention you're coming to... I'm coming to this very This room. very theatre. Yes. Um, yeah. On the 22nd of May 2020. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah. Who knows if we'll Save still be the here date. then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if uh, post Brexit, Leicester's yeah, the first true. place that's going. I yeah. tell you, that's, they're not going to, they're not sending any resources here. There'll be no medicine. The zombie apocalypse will be. I know. I mean, at least you'll be used to it. If we're, if you we're might spared. actually, Leicester might be the one that flourishes, yeah. just having lived this in this terrible situation and then. <laughs> The rest of us won't be able to cope. Let's go, what's wrong? <laughs> it's slightly better than it was. I don't have to take this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Look, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And Lester should be very proud to have done one good thing. <laughs> 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 Having created you. Ladies and gentlemen, Grace Petrie. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming. Tell your friends I'll be uh, up there somewhere after the show. Bye bye. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>